We are going to be speaking today about mathematical, statistical, and predictive modeling in nutrition and obesity research. This is an area that, depending on how you look at it, goes back a very long time, probably through the history of science, involves predictive, statistical, and mathematical modeling in one way or another. On the other hand, its explicit recognition, uh, particularly in some of the more mathematical models, has been a little bit more recent, and I think probably no two people have been more influential in driving that recent increase in interest in the mathematical modeling per se than my co-chair, Kevin Hall, and one of our speakers, Dr. Diana Thomas, and we're very lucky to have them both here. I'm going to start with some introductory remarks just to get things warmed up, and then I'll turn it over to our speakers in order. So. Um, as you've heard, my name is David Allison. This is the title of our, my talk, which is Introduction from Predictive Linear Modeling, excuse me, Predictive Modeling from Linear Regression Models to Mechanistic Mathematical Modeling. And I want to thank Keisuke Ajima and Anarina Murillo, who helped me prepare these slides. These are my own disclosures. I won't read them to you. You're welcome to email me for the slides. I also want to point out that the session sponsor is ILSI North America Technical Committee on Protein. But one of the things that we see quite commonly in the field of science in general, and we see it as much in, as anywhere in nutrition and obesity, is that mistakes are common. We're all human. We all make mistakes. And one of the common ways in which people make mistakes is, you might say, mathematical errors or poor mathematical thinking. And I give one example of that here. This came from a paper I stumbled on about two years ago or so called Modeling Potential Effects of Reduced Calories in Kids' Meals with Toy Giveaways. And I saw this paper, and this quotation was in it, which said that if a policy was put into place that reduced the number of calories in a typical kid's meal, a child who eats an average of two uh, kids' meals at a fast food restaurant per week, which is about the average, would avoid approximately 132 calories per week. And this would lead to, when you multiplied it out, about two pounds less weight gain per year. Now, that sounded a little ambitious to me. Now, maybe not crazy, but a little ambitious. Then I read further, and I saw this. Calculations in the model include children who are estimated to eat fast food four or more times per day. Now, this means that a child is eating 28 meals at a fast food restaurant per week, four times a day, seven days a week. This seemed implausible to say the least to me, but it went on to say that they would avoid a weight gain of 27 pounds per year. And then I'm thinking, how many kids even gain 27 pounds per year? Would a kid have negative growth if they gained 27 pounds per year? Is this even slightly plausible? And so I emailed Kevin, who has uh, a well-validated model for predicting weight changes in children as a function of changes in energy intake or expenditure. And I said, can you run this through your, mo your model because I know that the model they're using is not correct. And he did, and he sent back this message, which indicates that the authors were off by, depending on how far out in time you wanted to go, at least in order of magnitude. The further out in time you went, because it's a linear projection, the more off it is. And so we wrote a letter to the editor, and I was very impressed by the authors, who then chose to retract their paper. They didn't have to. I suppose they could have just said, we're sorry, we have an error, and fixed it. And they said, you know, you're right. We made a mistake, and we retracted the paper. I think that was the right thing to do, and I admire them for that. How can we avoid these kinds of things? Well, actually, on a phone conversation in preparation for this meeting, Kevin mentioned this book, which I went out and then got. I listened to it on audio. Uh, it's a fantastic book. I highly encourage you to uh, think about it. Very enjoyable, has a few obesity-related examples in it. Um, and it's about how to think mathematically. And as the author says, you don't need to have any mathematical knowledge beyond uh, probably high school, junior high school algebra uh, to understand this book. And yet, you can think about lots of mistakes to avoid, lots of how to look for mathematical inconsistencies and things, how to look for projections that don't make sense, and so on. All right, what about modeling? Well, there are different kinds of modeling to consider. There's predictive modeling based upon data that predict new observations from within observed data, observed space. Classic examples are, for example, RMR prediction equations. So you have somebody's height, weight, age, race, sex, 
and you want to predict their resting metabolic rate using a regression type equation. That would be this type of thing. There's deterministic modeling. You're going to hear more about that from Diana Thomas and Kevin Hall later, uh, in which a mathematical model, often based upon some theory, is provided, and it predicts deterministically what somebody's, for example, weight would be uh, under some circumstances. And then there's predictive modeling tasks, what if questions that usually involve extrapolation. This is very common in policy, where we say, what if we implemented this policy? Now we are not staying within the observed space of data, but we're extrapolating to a future time to an unobserved space, and that obviously involves heavier assumptions and entails different methods. And I'll just tease you a little bit with some tweaks at that. Predictive models based upon data, these are very common. We talk about it, my colleagues and I, in this paper here. The big thing here is validation. You know, uh, I think it was, um, now I'm blanking on it, Diana's going to remind me at some point, but somebody once said, give me enough parameters and I can fit a line to an elephant. Give me a few more parameters and I can make the elephant dance. All right, so if you put enough parameters in, you can fit any data set effectively perfectly. The problem, though, is that when you go to a new data set, you will have overfit the data. And that's illustrated in this sort of stylistic figure here, where you take a training data set to which you fit the data, and the more complicated you make it, model complexity, the more parameters you add, the better the model fit gets. Prediction error goes down. But when you go to a new data set, the testing data, usually if you didn't make it complicated enough, you won't capture the richness of the, the situation, and you'll have poor prediction. But if you made it too complicated, you'll have start to overfit to the noise in the data, and it won't validate well. So cross-validation is very important, and a common mistake people make, we see this all the time, I see it in uh, groups at UAB that I work with when I have to send our folks back, no, do it again. What they do is they inadvertently allow the test data to come into play, I should say play, not pay, sorry, in model selection or development. So that, for example, people take the whole data set, they look through and say, which variables look like good predictors in this data set? They say, oh, these 10 variables look good. Then they split the data set in half, test and training. They take those 10 variables, they come up with a regression equation based upon the training data, and then they say, now I independently validated in the test data, and it looks really good. Well, what was the mistake? They used the test data to pick the 10 variables. It's totally invalid. So this is a very common mistake, and if you want to think about how to do it well, I suggest you looking at this paper. Deterministic models, these are just two examples from the literature. I won't belabor them because you're going to hear more about them later today. Um, these are models that start to get more in making projections. They're still, uh, this particular one is still deterministic. This is modeling social contagion based upon the work initially of Christakis and Fowler suggesting that perhaps obesity had uh, in some sense a contagious element, not necessarily meaning literally a viral, or it could be, but uh, perhaps a social contagious element. And then others, including Dr. Keisuke Ajima, a postdoctoral fellow, in my group at UAB has come up with models like this. And here's one of his papers in which he's trying to estimate over time what happens to the obesity prevalence. We've had other things where we do these across generations. This is John Dawson, a former postdoc in our group, now at Texas Tech, and Keisuke Ajima. And you can see different types of models with different purposes and different assumptions, whether stochastic elements are built in, um, and what's important here is to realize that the assumptions matter. All of these things tend to lead to predictions that eventually the obesity level will level off. It's, we're actually perhaps near the level now where it will level off, but, and that's important. So when we think about people making claims that certain policy interventions are causing the leveling off, we might say maybe we would have just predicted it would level off without the policy interventions you're claiming have been effective. But, um, we do get somewhat different results depending upon the assumptions we built in, build in, and that's a really important thing. Assumptions always matter. You get in what you put out. This is particularly clear when you start to talk about these agent-based models or other models for projecting policy effects. Here's one paper that came out recently that talked about that, and I think someone once said that all truths are tautological. Right? If I say to you 2x equals 4, 
and you say, aha, I have derived from this the truth that x equals 2. Which, well, you know, that's good, that's right. Someone else might come along and say, well, you don't really derive anything. I mean, it's just a restatement. Saying 2x equals 4 is really the same as saying x equals 2. It's just a, a, a restatement of uh, something, a tautology. Well, in some sense, all truths are tautological, but some are more apparent than others. And if you've made such heavy model assumptions, in other words, you say, I assume my treatments are effective, and then having assumed they're effective, I project their long-term efficacy, and then you conclude, aha, I have long-term efficacy, you've kind of just gotten out what you put in, and that's called petitio principi, or begging the question. There's agent-based modeling. Here's a nice example of that. Again, I'm not going to go through the details, but in which you allow a computer to set up a series of interacting elements that follow certain rules and allow you to figure out what would happen with those interacting elements. Those elements could be people, for example. They could be cells. They could be C. elegans, worms, whatever you wish. And it allows you to potentially figure out what would happen when you don't have the ability to do it in closed mathematical form. There are empirical regression models. Emily Durander, I think, is going to talk a little bit about this. And here it becomes important to try to make them realistic. One of the things that's challenging is goes back to these assumptions. And we often don't know what assumptions to put in our model and so, models. And so whatever possible, we want them to be empirically informed. And here Emily, I think, is going to talk a little about model, uh, some modeling we've done in which we've shown that unless you take into account the spontaneous behavioral compensation that occurs with interventions around obesity, you may radically overestimate the effects of any intervention. Finally, I'm going to wrap up by saying we offer some courses on these types of ideas at UAB. And you can go to our website listed here. And we're offering some this summer. And I hope some of you will consider coming. And so at this point, let me just say thank you.